Well, what? Let there be light. <laughs> Miracles happen, everyone. I think we can wrap it up. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at the Island Church. Pastor Fred and Liz, our lead pastors, are away at a uh, missions conference for uh, Cuba Bible College, uh, which is one of the amazing ministries we support that's raising up ministers and missionaries uh, in Cuba to go into uh, all of the world. And so they're there. Pray for them. They'll be back uh, this Sunday. Actually, I, I say they'll be back, but the conference is in uh, South Florida, and it's a little cold up here in South Alabama, so uh, I may be back here next Sunday. So just kidding, just joking, just joking. We want to say welcome to everybody online. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad you're with us. Uh, whether it's the East Coast, West Coast, Gulf Coast, we're glad you're here. And uh, thank you for being a part of what we're going to be doing. And if you are watching online, we are going to take communion at the end. So uh, I want to give you a heads up so you can get those elements ready. And for those of you who are in the house in person, we'll be taking communion at the end as well. So uh, make sure and, and don't slip out early and try to start that car just to get a little warmer for your spouse. Although that would be very sweet. You can do that while she's fellowshipping in the lobby. Okay, gentlemen? Amen? All right. Well, it's my honor and privilege to kick off this new series. We're going through the book of James verse by verse. And uh, I love that kind of preaching because uh, in, in, you can't skip over anything uh, the Bible says that might be unpopular or controversial. Now, it's not going to be that kind of message today because some of you had to look like, oh boy, what are we in for? I better get Pastor Fred back here right away. Uh, no, I, I just love it because uh, it's just easy for us as, as pastors uh, just to pick and choose scriptures and, and not teach all of God's word. And one thing I love about the Island Church is that this is a Bible-believing, Bible-valuing church. Amen? And so if you're wondering what kind of, if you're a visitor, you're wondering what kind of church this is, this is a Jesus-following Bible-believing church. That's where you're at this morning. And so we're going to be going through this series, uh, scripture by scripture. And uh, it's been on Pastor Fred's heart to, to start this off and get this going. And uh, I'm doing kind of a little bit of a backstory uh, about James and who he is. So I'm going to be uh, kind of telling a story this morning from God's word and sort of like a detective piecing some of these scriptures together that give us some insight into uh, this epistle, this book of James. And so uh, that's what we're going to be doing here this morning. So we are going to go to James 1.1. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with us. And uh, we're going to open this off. Uh, in James 1.1, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Now, for that to bear any weight whatsoever, you got to know who James is. See, when you get into uh, who these authors are, who wrote these books of the Bible, uh, the story really comes alive and becomes a lot richer. And, uh, and so James, he identifies himself as a servant of God, but he's really more than that. He's Jesus' brother, okay? In the, in the Gospels, we find out that uh, after uh, the virgin birth, which uh, if you're new to the faith, we as Christians, we don't get to tell God who he is. We don't get to reveal to humanity who we think God is. We have God's word, and God's word reveals the story about how the Messiah, Jesus, came into this world, and it was through a virgin birth. We believe that. Why? Because that's what the gospels testify to. That's what the Old Testament prophesied, that that's how the Messiah, Jesus, our Savior, that's how Emmanuel, God with us, would come into the world. And Joseph was Jesus' adopted father, I have a son named Sam. He just turned four years old. Uh, he, he, he had big, big curly hair uh, all over, and he got a haircut, and now it's just big curly hair right on top. You might not recognize him, but he, he'll be running around the lobby, and you'll see him tell him he, you like his haircut because he calls it his big boy haircut, okay? See, see, here's the thing about adoption, though. Joseph adopted Jesus as a son. He was his legal father. He was his earthly daddy. Hello? I am my son's earthly father. He's got a heavenly father named, named Jesus, but I am his earthly father. I am his legal daddy. Hello? All adopted parents said amen, right? You get that. We are family. So, so Joseph is, 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 is Jesus' adopted father. Mary, uh, she gave birth. She, was, she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Mary is Jesus' earthly mother. But here's the thing. Joseph and Mary, without being too inappropriate this morning, 
had other children the old-fashioned way, okay? Okay? Enough said? All right. They had other children. So in the Gospels, we have Jesus has brothers and sisters, and he's got earthly family, okay? And so, so James, who is James? James is Jesus' brother, but he's the oldest son, other than Jesus, to Mary and Joseph. He's the next sibling in line. That's who James is. James is Jesus' brother, but he's also their firstborn to Mary and Joseph. And some of the speculation, uh, it's really stronger than speculation, uh, when we connect the dots from church history, from Acts and Galatians and other places in the Bible, it, it, it's thought that James took a, a religious track, that James went and studied uh, the priesthood. That, that was kind of his life route that James went down. See, Jesus, in the irony of ironies, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, because there were some, some, some uh, 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 negative perception about the and some questions about his birth, Jesus couldn't, Jesus couldn't go into the priesthood. Hello? Jesus, the son of God, went into his father's work. He went into carpentry and worked with his dad. And, 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 and he couldn't go into uh, the priesthood because some of the speculation, speculation around his birth. Because just in Bible times, just like today, people had a hard time believing in a virgin birth. Hello? Sometimes you got to cast yourself in the role uh, of scripture, just as a character there, just to empathize with what people are going through, all right? If your daughter, gentlemen, came to you and said, I'm pregnant, the Holy Spirit's the father, you'd be like, we're taking a paternity test right now, hello? I mean, you, you wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, you know what I'm saying, hello? That's why there's these angelic visits and confirmation, just sometimes there's this thought that, oh, in the ancient world, you know, we're so, we're so advanced today. They were just more gullible and tend to believe superstitions. No, that's not true. Rational thinking's been around for a long time. Hello? Are you with me? And so just in Bible times, there was some doubts. And so, so Jesus became a carpenter. And, and James, uh, he, he took kind of a, they believe it was like a Nazarite sort of track, a Nazarite valley. And he, he was pure and he went on this religious track for his life. Okay? And that's where James went. And, and, and that really comes to manifest later at the end of his life where, where God really uses that. And we'll come back to that. But James doesn't necessarily have a, a tight relationship with Jesus. See, all of us have significant plot points in our lives. There's the big beats of your life that make up the music of your life. Your birth, who you married, the birth of your children, your first job, your first car, your first house, the business that you started that succeeded, the 10 you started before that that failed. All of those things make up the story of your life, where you lived, whether you were an Alabama or Auburn fan. People are going to want to know. Can I tell you? They're not going to want to know. <laughs> well, but we have these significant critical moments, and, and that is absolutely true for these people who wrote the Bible as well. They wrote the Bible under the inspiration of the Spirit. Uh, it was God through them. God inspiring what they wrote. Paul at one point says, it's not me writing this, but the Spirit of God is writing this. Hello? And so there's an awareness that they, they're writing this down uh, as, uh, by the power and presence of God. But also these, these men still had stories. Hello? They had lives. And the story of James is really rich and interesting and provides some great context for this book of the Bible moving forward. So we're gonna hit the beats of James' life moving forward. So who is James? He's a distant brother. He's Jesus' distant brother. What do I mean by distant? I don't just mean like they're not very close, okay? How many of you are from a big family, you have lots of brothers and siblings? Raise your hand. You get this like I get this, because I got a lot of brothers and sisters. Some of those brothers and sisters you're a little bit closer to than the other brothers and sisters, right? Now, we don't tell them that. We never say that, okay? I hope my siblings, who sometimes tune in when I'm preaching, are not listening to this right now because I'm closer to some of them than I am others, okay? I love them all, amen? Everybody gets a trophy, you know? <laughs> Brian, Cherry, Diana, love you guys. They're probably laughing at that right now if they watch this. But... 
it's not just that they, oh, they, they weren't tight. There, there is a, 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 a distance there. there. There is some static there. And we see this in the Bible. In Matthew 13, verses 54 through 55. And coming to his hometown, him, his being Jesus, and coming to Jesus' hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. So that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And then verse 56 actually goes on to say that they took offense at Jesus. See, James is the eldest after Jesus. Jesus goes this blue-collar route. James goes this white-collar route. James is this religious trainee. And now Jesus is getting all this attention and affection and following. And there's some marvelous claims and superstitions coming around Jesus. And his brothers are there, and they're like, this is just a regular guy. There, there's some tension developing, and it just continues to, to, to manifest and grow. And, and John had to grow up with some of these stories about uh, a, a supernatural birth. Uh, and these stories cast some shadow on him and his family. And he walked this pure, uh, likely Nazarite track into religious studies and going into the priesthood. And, and he was going to be the man of God. But then his brother is the literal man who is God. And so there's this tension developing there and it continues to manifest into the second beat of his life, which is this. James becomes a scathing skeptic, a scathing skeptic. John 7, one through five says this. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee, go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works that you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Now there's some sarcasm and mockery in, in the tone of how we read that. You could easily read it in such a way that, that says, well, nobody who wants to be a public figure like you, you know, sneaks around. And if you can really do these things, show yourself to the world. Consistent with other criticisms that Jesus faced from his accusers, not least of all, Satan himself. So his brothers have moved to a place where, where uh, they don't believe him, but they're also mocking the claims surrounding him. Furthermore, James being the eldest, every time someone speaks on behalf of the family, those are likely things that James said, as would have been customary for the time to be speaking for the family, being the eldest that's with the family. So when the leaders are looking to kill Jesus, it's also his brothers that, that hear this news first. Why? Well, James is probably in that priestly world. He would have had access to that information. He didn't see uh, Caiaphas on Twitter post it. No, he would have been in that community, in that world, and found out that news that, that Jesus needed to move on because there were people coming to harm him. Now, he didn't necessarily want his brother to die, but the scathingness of his skepticism of Jesus only grows, and he grows and picks up in, in, in Mark 3, verses 20 through 21. Then Jesus, he being Jesus, went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, saying, he is out of his mind. What's happening there? Jesus is so popular, doing miracles, doing wonders, attracting this large following. It's, it's stirring up the home life, the family life. And what happens? His brothers, his sisters, show up. And who's probably speaking on behalf of them? James. And what does James say to the crowd? Jesus is out of his mind. Now, sometimes, like I said earlier, we have to cast ourselves in the role. We're like, man, what a, because what a sadness to be so close to Jesus and miss him. Hello? 
But I, I want to tell you, if you have brothers or sisters, particularly you men with brothers, I have a brother. And if my brother came to me with his friends and said he was God, I would have more than a few doubts. Hello? Listen, I know uh, my brother, and he's a good man. I know some of his friends, and their credibility is less than reliable. One of them, I won't mention who because this is a live broadcast, and I don't want to slander anyone, as a young adult accidentally shot himself in the foot, all right? Another one who could do some electrical work on my brother's car, who went on to be a great electrician, but this is one of his first projects, rewired my brother's 74 Cutlass, and you know what? It caught on fire and burnt up. Hello? So if my brother and his friends came to me claiming signs and wonders, I'd be a little doubtful to say the least. Amen? So that's kind of what's going on with James. I mean, when you have siblings, you see all kinds of things growing up you don't want to see. Hello? And then that person comes and says, I am Emmanuel, God with you? What? You know what I mean? And so that's what James is going through. And, and because James's identity, I think, is wrapped up in, in this religiosity, this, this priestliness, this rabbinicalness, and, and Jesus poses a threat to that, this tension is just mounting, and he's saying he is out of his mind. He moves from a distant brother to a scathing skeptic. But that's not where the story ends for James. The Bible, through bits and pieces through the New Testament, gives us the story. And how many of you know that God changes lives? Hello? How many of you know that our God is into transformation? He's into making dead things alive again. Hello? He turns water into wine. Hello? He, 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 I mean, even if you want to break this down on, 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 a, on, a, on a macro, big level, look at our God. Look at creation. God doesn't waste anything that he has created even the most least desirable substance on earth has immense value in farming. You can read between the lines on that, all right? God doesn't waste anything, hello? God cares on a deep level. I mean, look at the ants. The ants are organized. God created them little annoying pesky things that bite us in the summertime, hello? And they have structure and systems and purpose. Our God cares down to the details, Hello? Our God has the capacity to care down to the smallest details of your life. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Amen? He knows what you're walking through. And see, one of the big takeaways that we're going to come back to is that I really want to resonate here at the Island Church this morning is that God changes lives. The next beat of James's life is this, is that he becomes a transformed believer. A transformed believer. Not just a believer. The Bible says that even the demons believe and they know to be scared of God. That's what it says, hello? And by that metric, a lot of people who have faith in God really need to have more faith than a demon, hello? And by that metric, a lot of people who have faith in God have less faith than that because they believe in God but they do not fear him or revere him. And so James doesn't stay distant and skeptical. Something happens and Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, tells us what happens. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. Paul is telling us about the pivotal transformational moment in James's life. Well, how do we know that's not James the disciple? Well, that same text says he appeared to the 12. Hello? 
This is a different James. Which James is this? This is James the skeptic. This is James the distant brother. This is James the person who is kin to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and couldn't believe it. And now he totally would have saw his brother die, would have known where they put his body, but then he totally saw him walking around thereafter in flesh and spirit. Amen? How many know when you encounter the resurrected Jesus, that'll change your life? That'll change your life. And listen, if you've encountered any other Jesus that hasn't been resurrected, it isn't the real Jesus. Hello? Because the Christ of the Bible was fully dead and fully alive. I had a kind young adult gentleman after first service this morning ask me, so when Jesus raised, was he just kind of like a ghost, you know, like in Star Wars, they have the force ghosts? And was that kind of, No, he was fully physically dead. And three days later, he was fully physically alive, showing the disciples the scars on his hands, showing him the wounds and what happened. James would have known and seen that Jesus was fully dead. And then he would have known and seen that Jesus was fully alive. Hello? Listen. Christianity is unique when compared to the religions of the world, to the cults of the world, or whatever. Because guess what? We have not found his body. Hello? Listen, Muhammad is buried under the green dome. Buddha is, it was cremated in Kushnagar. But Jesus, he went in the grave and he popped back out. Hello? And even his opponent said, oh, you stole the body. But we know why they made up that story. Because the body was gone. Hello? Jesus is alive, amen? And where is he? He's seated, as the Bible said, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And that's good for you and for me because guess what? We know Jesus who sits next to the judge, God the Father. Amen? Man, if you ever get a traffic ticket, it's good to know the judge. Hello? <laughs> Problem with our sin is that's a traffic ticket you and I can't pay. Hello? But guess what? We got a perfect meteor in Jesus Christ. Amen? Can we celebrate that this morning? This morning, Jesus is good. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our savior. Jesus was fully dead. Jesus is fully alive. And you say that today, people think you're crazy. But guess what? Listen, rather be crazy and saved than sane and uh, not saved. Hello? All right? And honestly, listen. When you look at the claims of the Bible, I, ha I had a friend who was a nurse. Uh, they're missionaries now, but she was a nurse in, in an in a, uh, in a emergency room. She was in the triage unit. And she was like, if I told you just what I experienced on a monthly basis, you wouldn't believe it. I've seen people who we thought were dead, 15 minutes, they're back alive. She said, I have seen crazy stuff. She had horrible stories that I would never repeat because it just made me hurt when I think about them in the medical field. She's like, so no, it's not hard for me to believe that Jesus was fully dead and then fully alive. And she said that time to me at a time when I was questioning some of what I believe. And it's okay to question those things as long as you're trying to seek truth. Because you can question yourself out of something because you're trying to get away from it, or you can seek truth. And if you seek truth, I think you'll find truth. And truth is incarnate in Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what happened to James. James encountered the resurrected Jesus. And then what happens? Well, the Bible tells us more. James becomes a pastor of pastors a leader of leaders. Galatians 1, 18 through 19 says this. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, who was Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. This is Paul who wrote Galatians. Paul is telling his discipleship story. He, he's talking about the men of the faith who invested in him. He, he, he's talking about who coached him to where he's at now. And who did he go to for coaching? Well, he went to Peter. Peter was Jesus' right-hand dude. And then who else did he go to? James. James had a radical transformation. And then James, the interesting thing about him is that he didn't leave Jerusalem. See, James saw himself once he committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ and then defining himself as a servant of Jesus, he didn't really see himself as something new, new in that he's a new creation in Christ, but he saw himself as the culmination of what it meant to be Jewish, that he was expecting the Messiah, they believed in the scriptures of old, and guess what? He had encountered the Messiah, 
So he kept on doing his priestly duties there in Jerusalem, but he attracted people who were Jewish, but he also attracted Christians because he was preaching Christ crucified. That's why he stayed. And so Paul gets trained by, by Peter and by James. And then also elsewhere in Galatians in 2.9, Paul says this about these men in his gratitude towards them. He says, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed pillars. You want to know where the statement pillar of the faith comes from? It's that text. Who are the esteemed pillars? It's James, it's Cephas, and John. Those esteemed pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. Can you imagine me and Paul? Paul persecuted the church. He arranged the killing and execution of some of those early believers. And yet he had this encounter on the road with the resurrected Jesus. But there weren't a lot of witnesses. And so now he's got to go and, and, and get training. And he's going to these men. And all they know about him is that he is a, a bad guy. He's the persecutor of the church. He's the villain of the story. But, but the men of God, these men of God, Cephas, James, they recognize him and train him. And I don't think James had any problem recognizing him. You know why? Because you've heard the, the phrase, you spot it because you got it, or you spot it because you had it. James recognized that he was once a persecutor, a mocker, an, an opponent of Jesus, and was transformed in the same way. And he receives Paul and pours into the life of Paul. And then Paul goes on to do some pretty big things including writing two-thirds of the New Testament, which, which is no small feat. Hello? But that's not the end of his life. Now, the story of the early church goes on. The last kind of narrative of the New Testament really is Acts. Revelation is, is prophetic. It's, it's, it's a lot of foretelling. It's a lot of... Uh, uh, pictures of, of end times and different things happening. And, and the Revelation says we're blessed if we study it and it's worth studying. But the last, like, story, the last narrative, and, you know, Corinthians, Second Corinthians, those are teaching, those are letters, those are epistles, those are those kind of things are for instruction. But the last story, the last bit of story we get is from Acts. And where Acts leaves off is Paul is under house arrest writing some of these uh, letters and epistles and those sorts of things. And James is in Jerusalem leading the church reaching the Jews, leading them to the, the, the true Messiah, Jesus Christ. That's where the story ends. But the story doesn't stop. How do we know the story doesn't stop? Well, well we're here. Island Church is here. First Baptist is here. Every other church is here. The gospel went forward to Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Amen? Amen. So what happened to James? That's the question. Well, the last beat of his life is that he, he became a martyr. Now, the Bible doesn't talk about how James died, but there's these other texts that point to the validity and reliability of Scripture. Because guess what? If there were no historical evidence for Jesus and these stories in the Bible, we ought to have some doubts. Hello? But when these things happen, there's a ripple through time. One Roman historian, Tacitus, says a marvelous superstition came out of Rome that a dead man is now alive. The Jewish historian Josephus said Jesus was dead, then he was alive, he was the Messiah, and then he goes on to talk about some like aqueducts they were building at that time, which is a significant historical moment, I guess. Read it, it's wild. It's like, am I reading something, like some, some kind of Christian writing here? And he's just telling you, what happened in those times? And then we have Eusebius, who's a church historian, who, who recorded what happened after Acts. And, and the story of what happened with James was well known in the early church. And so it's not from Scripture. It's from Eusebius, who, who writes about the first three centuries of the Christian church, from Christ to Constantine. It's one of Western civilization's classics. It's, you know, we probably don't read it in school too much anymore, but it's what happened after Acts. And these historians, Josephus, Hegapus, Eusebius, they all confirm what happened to James. Josephus says he died in between a transition of power of Roman governors around 62 AD. 
Hegapus wrote that at the end of James' life, people would call him old camel knees. Old camel knees. And he says because he was often alone in the temple praying to God on his knees for forgiveness for the Jewish people. Because they, like James at first, rejected Jesus. They said he spent so much time in prayer on his knees that uh, that they became hard like those of camels. Hello? Anybody relate this morning? So later when James says in his book, in the Bible, if any of his, anybody among us is sick or hurting, call the elders forward and, and come and let them lay hands on you and pray. When he's talking about praying for healing, he felt it in a personal way. Hello? Old camel knees. Hello? Got any old camel knees in here this morning? Don't raise your hand, okay? So that's what was said about James. And then Eusebius records the final moments of his life. Eusebius, in the history of the Christian church from Christ to Constantine, notes that James was so respectful or so respected and influential in the religious community, which just validates this idea that he went on that white collar priestly track and he had all this credibility and respect from the Jews. And because he had so much respect and the gospel was going forth and Jews were coming to know Jesus and and, and, and it was also said by Eusebius that when, when James would say that Jesus is a savior, people in the ruling class, the elites, some of the Pharisees would come to faith because James was so influential and credible. And because of his credibility, when these, the gospel was converting large numbers of Jews, as we reach, read about in Acts 2, The the Jewish leaders pleaded with with James to come and address the people. And what they assumed is that James, because he was likely still functioning in those priestly duties, because he saw himself as a fully Jewish person, expecting the Messiah, and then found the Messiah. They expected him, James, to err on the side of the traditional view that Jesus, uh, some of the... Uh, rabbinical books treat Jesus like he was a magician or fortune teller or something like that. So they call James forward to to clear up the confusion. And Eusebius' account goes like this. The Jewish leaders assembled a crowd on the summit of the temple where all can see and hear to him. And they said to James, we are bound to obey you as you are just. The The people are confused and following a dead man named Jesus. Tell us about the crucified Jesus. James calls out loudly, and it'll be on the screen behind me. Why do you ask me about Jesus? He sits in heaven at the right hand of God and will return on the clouds of heaven. How many say amen to that? How many say that's a testimony? People in that moment, you see this record, some people began saying, Hosanna, Jesus is the son of David. And people came to faith and it kind of turned into a riot and his opposers uh, attacked James and they push him off the summit of the temple. And James hits the ground but doesn't die and Eusebius records that the people below begin to stone him and throw rocks at him. And, and someone said, wait, he's saying something, he's saying something. And, and someone said, he's, James the just is praying for you. And then uh, as it's reported, he was hit with a laundry club in the head, and that was the end of James' life. He died doing what he had been doing so much during his lifetime, which is praying for the people who are far from God. He's a martyr. So when he talks about things like faith and works, he's, he's someone who knows what he's talking about. Four quick takeaways in conclusion. What does this all mean? Is this, just, is this just a history lesson? No, I think it's more than that. I believe it gives us rich access to what's really going on in this book of the Bible. But here's four big takeaways, and I think someone needs to hear this this morning. Number one, God can turn skeptics into servants. Let me say that again, because I believe that there's some people here. You have family members who are far from God. You have family members who you're like, they will never, by, by all earthly vision, they will never come to faith in Jesus. And, and Jesus may have felt that in his humanity at times too with his brother James, but our God is a God that turns skeptics into servants. He changes lives. Number two, our God can turn enemies into friends. Our God can turn enemies into friends. Do you know that all of us, 
in our sin, we were enemies of God. You're like, oh, I was never an enemy of God. When we were in our sin, we were enemies of God. Hello? And what did God accomplish through Christ Jesus? He reconciled us in relationship, and now we are friends with God. Amen? That's good news. It's not because of what I did, but it's because of what he did. Hello? That's grace. That's good news. That's forgiveness. That's the redemption that you and I need. God can turn enemies into friends. Enemies into friends. You might have a coworker, a family member who is so hostile towards faith. You might be here this morning in, in, in the beats of James' life that you relate to in relation to Jesus Christ are the distant brother or the skeptic. But guess what? God is calling you out of a place of being his enemy into relationship, into friendship, into new life. Hello? We serve a God that turns water into wine. I know none of us drink around here, but that's what he does. He makes all things new. God can also turn obstacles into opportunities. He can turn obstacles into opportunities. Remember, the religious class, they oppose Jesus, they question Jesus, and ultimately they're responsible for conspiring and getting Jesus arrested, flogged, and crucified. They were an obstacle all the way. James, his skepticism, his mockery of Jesus, that was an obstacle. But guess what? As James went through that priestly track and, and became an influential person in the Jewish religious community, what happened? God used his position for the advancement of the gospel. And as James preached that Jesus was the Messiah, even members of the ruling class came to saving faith. God flips obstacles on their head and turns them into opportunities. And number four, God can turn requests into results. That's a big theme in this book of the Bible moving forward. James says, a prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Someone who prays. Someone who plays out of a place of purity will see mountains move. And here's the thing in that text. It's not praying through my righteousness because my righteousness is worth nothing. The prayer of a righteous man knows where his righteousness comes from. And it's the righteousness of Christ given to us by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Whatever you're walking through, our God is able. Skeptics into servants, enemies into friend, obstacles into opportunities, requests into results, death into life. Amen? Bow your heads in prayer with me. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for your goodness, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we prepare our hearts to take communion, as we, as we prepare our hearts, Lord, I pray that if any of us here are, are relating more to just distance with you or skepticism of you, I pray that by your spirit, Lord, that you would draw them home to you. That even right now, that you would do an inner working in the heart that draws all who are far from you to come and sit with you at your table and fellowship with you. Lord, we're thankful for the Island Church. We're thankful for this morning. We're thankful for the stories of the saints. And we're thankful, Lord, for your word, which never fails. And so, Lord, bless this time of communion as we remember your sacrifice. And it's in Jesus' name we all said, amen. Will you guys welcome Pastor Philip as he comes to lead us in a time of communion? I love that, brother. I love that. Wow. That's amazing. That biographical background information on James to give us an understanding of what we're about to walk through in the book of James. And then even that description of the transition that took place in James's life. From a rival sibling to a skeptic to a believer but then to a disciple maker and a prayer warrior and someone that would lay their life down for Christ. Why? Because he encountered the Christ. He, did, he had encountered his brother. He knew about Jesus, but then he encountered the risen Christ. And that's the difference maker in us. That's the difference maker when we find and believe 
God was born, he died, he rose from the dead. When you came in this morning, you were given uh, elements for communion. If anyone's in here and maybe we missed you, could you lift your hand up for us this morning and we'll make sure that you get your communion elements. Amen. Praise the Lord. Will you stand with me this morning? Stand with us. Those of you at home, of course, can grab your bread, your juice. We're glad that you're with us. We recognize that communion is holy. It's to be reverenced. We're given instructions in the Word about communion. That we should do it often. And that when we do it, we should do it in remembrance of Christ. We have open communion here at the Island Church. That simply means that you don't have to be a member of the Island Church. As long as you're a member of the body of Christ, the family of God, you can receive communion this morning. He gives us instruction about ourselves, that we should examine ourselves. In 1 Corinthians, we find he says that whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. He says, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We have a moment this morning. What an opportune time to take a moment. Examine yourself. Is there anything there? Maybe something that slipped by and we haven't addressed. What an opportunity right now to address that. Lord, draw us close to you. We have instructions for you at the Island Church that are practical. If you'll make sure you pull that little plastic film, it'll make it easier to get to that wafer there. Once you pull the big thick one off, it's hard to get to the wafer. You can take that part out. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. Even as I read that, even as we read that, on the night that he was betrayed, where was his focus? Communion with us. Fellowship with us. Continuing to develop that relationship with us. He came to be born in a manger. Why? So that there could be fellowship. Sin had broken that. He wanted to be in relationship with us. And on the night that he was betrayed, that's where his focus was. He took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it. Will you just break that there as he did? And said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Why was his body broken? That our bodies could receive health and healing. Wow. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your great love for us, your desire for relationship, fellowship with us. That you came to give us life and life more abundant, Father. And we thank you for the stripes that you took for your body that was offered up as a sacrifice that we could have health, that we could have healing. Lord, we receive this bread in remembrance of you. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It signifies that new covenant we have. Do this as often as you do it. Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. James saw. James saw him die. James was aware that he was placed in a tomb and that he was there for a while. But then James encountered Jesus Christ. And no longer did he describe himself as a brother. 
of Jesus Christ. He described himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. Take that cup. Maybe lift it up and we give thanks. Father, we thank you for your blood which was poured out for our salvation that brings us life in you and eternal life with you, Father. We thank you. We praise you this morning in Jesus' name. You may drink the cup. Mm. Praise the Lord. Can you give him praise this morning? Can you tell him thank you, Lord, for your life emptied out? Hey, can you show some appreciation to Pastor Matt this morning? What an awesome presentation to get us rolling into the book of James. Online, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being with us. We bless you as you go out today. We're so glad you joined us today for Worship and Word. If you prayed with us to commit your life to Christ or you want to know more, text the word NEXT to 251 251- 244-2030. We want to celebrate with you and help you in what comes next. Don't forget to click connect on our website if you're new. And to join us in giving, you can text Island Give to 77977 or visit the islandchurch.tv slash give. We pray you have an awesome week.